Guys, please be seated. We are about to start. You can stand up. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to first meeting for Outing Working Group in Bangkok. We're going to start with status update. You should have read not well and know what's inside and what you do and, you know. IPR disclosure, we'll ask IPR when we adopt document, we'll ask IPR when we last call document if not, everybody has responded to IPR document. It's not progress until we receive all the responses. Please remember that. Yenjing, thank you for taking notes. Uh, we are looking for someone on Jabber. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate it. Please sign the blue sheets and let's review the agenda. Busy day today. Not going to read it. But a lot of stuff. Law, could you please close the door? Are oh, there still people coming? Thank you. So, no documents published for this ATF. I'm looking at our AD. Uh, significant number of documents have been submitted to ISG. Uh, the Young models are still awaiting normative reference. Uh, I was told it's finally progressing, so by next ATF we should see an INE model adopted. So we are potentially looking for a new shepherd for this document because the previous one promised to do this for the last four ATFs. Uh, if you are interested, please let us know. It would be really great. We've got uh, four existing working group documents that are that were adopted before last ATF. So policy model, VRP BFD, destination routing, and timer parameter syncing. We've adopted three new drafts since last ATF: RPM model, ATN BGP, and draft ATF segment routing TILFA. We would really appreciate if author finally published the ITF draft. It still shows up as personal draft. And I think we are ready. Uh, Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ying Zhen. Um, I'm here to do two updates on data models. So the first one is uh, Rib Yang data model. Uh, we actually started working on this model three years ago. So at that time, this was an um, this was an augmentation of the routing config model. So some of the attributes that was originally defined in this model was moved to we we'll move to the routing config model, for example, like the ECMP stuff, the multi-hop support. Um, so then that routing config model later was published as RFC 8022. And then with NMDA, we updated that one to 8349. So with all those done, I think now it's time to give some priority to this model and then um, progress this one because um, the rig stuff 
is still important for routing. So let's look at some detailed stuff in the defined in this model, the rib tags preference repair path. So this one shows how the uh, next hop is augmented with preference, um, the routing preference, how you later decide which path to choose and then tag an application tag. We think those are um, critical stuff and those are not defined in the base um, routing config model. So, um, so this one has the, do we have one? So this one has the um, IPv4 dots, that's the single path, and then you have ECMP multi hop and that's the IPv6 part. They are pretty much the same thing. So um, this one has a uh, repair pass and then some other rip statistics, local, um, how many, like uh, for protocol wise, which protocol contributed which routes. So that's the detailed stuff you can take a look. And if you, please provide us any comments you have. And one thing I want to mention is we got um, good comments from Tom Patch, I'm not sure whether I pronounced his last name correct. So, but he provided a, a lot of good feedback. And for example, we changed our prefix name from rib in, into rib extension. So we think that's more appropriate because this one is really an extension to the base model. Um, this one is a very simple, straightforward one. So, but we'd like to progress it and we want to collect more comments and then request working group adoption because we think we now have time to really working on it, move it forward. How many people have read the draft? <laughs> Yours out. <there. laughs> Would be great if more people read it and provide some comments. Yeah, so um, please read it. Next one. Okay, so this one is the routing policy model. This one is the one we really want to progress it fast. This, because the policy serves as the centerpiece of all routing protocols. And so since last IETF, what we have done, nothing major. We made a lot of editorial changes based on our experience working on data models. What we have collected from the feedback from other models, all those editorial changes, including the right references, we made all those changes. And so the real changes, only this. So we made the, um, as suggested by Jeff Heiss last time, so we changed the type to bigger size. Those are the real changes, pretty much, that's it. And please, please read this document because we want to last call it pretty soon. That's it. Any question regarding this one? If you care about routing policy or, because this one is, uh, we really need it in order to make the whole IETF routing young models week work. Uh -huh. AC Linden, uh, Cisco Systems, I got a comment offline from Kayer. He wants us to encapsulate the lists and containers so you can uh, get them with a single get for all the, you know, like for instance, for a prefix list. Yeah. So that you you wouldn't have to iterate to get a, every entry in the prefix list. Okay, that I think we can do right after this IETF. That's a simple. I think we did that for OSPF also, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, because this one we arranged we took over from Open Config. A lot of stuff was not really IETF style, so we tried our best to make them more consistent with other models. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a question. Uh, 
uh, channeling Sue Harris and I suddenly my this thing is offline. Okay, yeah, it's back. Uh, please ask why they plan to when they plan when they plan to working group last call. Also, she gives plus one to the last point to give Patel's point. So she wants to know when are when is the working group last call going to be done? Uh, so. Oh, thank you. AC Lindum Cisco Systems. And I would say that it will be done well before the BGP model on, of which she's, a, she's the editor. Uh, jobs aside, I mean, if anyone plans to do any IT of routing data models, we need policies. So please read it, please look it up. We tried to keep it as close as we could to initial open config one, but adapt to IT if it's been significant amount of work. And again, it's important. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Huai Mao Chen. Slight technical difficulty with the Chromebook here, but uh, yes. While the chairs are sorting that out, uh, AC, I'm holding the BGP model based on this draft, so I'm responding to AC. You guys now talk directly, keep me out. <laughs> Yeah, almost there. Yeah, that's one. Okay. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, architecture uh, for use of BGP as a central controller. Not work. Yeah, next. Yeah, uh, go to uh, back, go back. This is the second, second page. Oh, delayed, okay.
it just went back to the power point. Yeah, good, good. That's, that's the power point. Yeah, yeah, we just go go this way. Uh, so, uh, in fact, PGP as a core of network uh, has lots of functions, has lots of capabilities. So, for example, PGP distributes the link states. So, also, PGP can distribute the segment, segment, segment ID information. So these, both in, so because of this one, PGP will maintain a traffic engineer database, and also it will retain a database for segment ID and labels. So PGP can control the uh, redirection of uh, traffic flows. So this is uh, defined by uh, flow spec. So PGP can distribute MPLS labels. And also PGP has a, a lot of flag, reflected function, functionalities. With this kind of functionalities, and then a rotor reflector, we can have a, a connection from rotor reflector to every node in the network which run uh, BGPs. So with this kind of uh, functions and uh, capabilities, so it's very simple to extend the BGP as a central controller, and also it's natural to extend the BGP as a central controller, and also it's very beneficial to extend the, uh, extend the BGP as a central controller. So if we use just to have a, some kind of simple extension to make a BGP as a central controller, this will simplify the network op operations. And also, we have very efficient way we can uh, use network uh, resource very e efficiently. Next one. So this slide we just talked about a, a building block, basic building block for a central controller. So we should have a, a traffic engineer database. So this database will store and maintains a traffic in, uh, engineer information. So we should have a, a, a database which maintains uh, the segment ID information for each node, each interface, and maybe some kind of uh, prefix. We should also have a, a database which maintains the uh, information about the tunnels. So this uh, information for tunnel will uh, include the path for the tunnel, and then the parameters configured by the users for the, for the tunnel. And also, if we, uh, because for a tunnel, we, we need to compute the uh, optimal path, which satisfies constraints for the tunnel. So those are, Pass we computed for a tunnel will be stored in the uh, tunnel and the pass uh, uh, database. And also, after we convert the pass, we need to re reserve the resource for the tunnel. For example, for uh, for uh, MPLS tunnel, we need to reserve bandwidth, and we need to re maybe reserve the the labels for segment tunnel. For segment routing tunnel, we need to allocate segment IDs for that tunnels. So those uh, three kind of uh, database we needed to have for the segment, uh, for the central controller. In addition to that, so we may have a, a CSPF to compute, compute paths for the tunnel. And then we may have another a building block, which uh, is a, a tunnel management. So tunnel management module will receive the re request from the operator or applications for the surface, and then we will get those uh, uh, initial resource, and then we will, we will uh, reserve the resource, and then we will set up the tunnels for the for tunnel, for tunnel management. So next slide. So you should have control of the slides now. Okay, good. Yes, 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 yes. So with those uh, building blocks, and then we can have uh, some kind of uh, uh, basic uh, reference architectures for the controllers. So first we just uh, uh, talk about uh, the basic uh, one uh, controller 
send your controller, and then we come up uh, with a controller cluster and then hierarchical controllers. So for one controller, uh, we we can have a, just to have some kind of relatively simple extensions to BGPs. For example, here, so for BGP, we already have a, a road reflector. So road ref reflector allow us to connect a road reflector to every node in the network, which runs BGP. In addition to that, so use this kind of uh, connections, we can uh, get uh, the initial information, traffic engineer information about the network using existing uh, communication uh, channels to the database. Also, for the segment, role, segment ID uh, information, because right now we already have those uh, kind of draft or is a uh, group uh, document. So use those extensions, we can also get a segment uh, ID information to the uh, segment, uh, ID, segment uh, ID uh, database. So this uh, module is uh, uh, internal in, in the controller. So with those kind of modules we, we talk about, such as tunnel management and the CSPF, and uh, those modules we talk about, and then we can come up with a, a basic one uh, BGP controller. So with this controller, and then, uh, for example, a uh, customer, we can receive a request from a user on the applications. And then as soon as we get those requests, and then, for example, we request for a tunnel and then using that, that tunnel carrier service. So with those requests, and then we can ask a CSPF to compute our optimal path, which satisfies some constraints. And then CSPF will, will access the traffic engineer database to get that pass. And then after that pass, after we have it that pass, and then we can reserve the resource for that tunnel. And then we can get a, if it's a segment, segment routing tunnel, and then we can allocate those segment IDs for that, that tunnel. And then we can store those information in the tunnel and the pass database for that tunnel, such as pass, and then the, the resource will be reserved. And then after we store those information, and then we can use uh, this communication uh, channel to set up the, the tunnel. Either is a segment routing tunnel or uh, MLP, M MPLS tunnels. So that's the uh, basic, uh, basic uh, BGP controller. So uh, as we know, the whole network is controlled by this controller, and then the re reliability is uh, very critical to customers. So in this case, we may uh, have, we should have kind of a redundancy uh, controllers. So, so that one solution for that redundancy or reliability is that we can have a, a control controller clusters. So the simple cluster is that we have uh, uh, two two controllers. One is an um, active one or primary one. The second one is a standby one. So those two controllers work together. So from a user's point of view, there are just one controller. From uh, inside the point of view, the two uh, work together, the synchronized uh, states and uh, synchronized uh, those uh, uh, control states. And then as long as one is done, for example, primary is, is that, and then the, act, the standby one will take over. So in this way, we can achieve a higher reliabilities. So in generally, we, uh, in general case, we can have a, a, a controller cluster, which contains a, a number of uh, controllers, such as primary controller, secondary, third, and then the ends controllers. These ends controllers work together, and then from outside purview, that's just the, as one controllers. And then as, as, as if one died, was n minus one died, and then we, if we still have one life, and then we still can manage to control the, the, the network. So the third architecture is uh, we, we can have a uh, hierarchical controllers. So in this hierarchical act, uh, architecture, we have uh, uh, 
a parent controller or called a super controller. So under this uh, super controller, we have a uh, uh, number of uh, uh, child controllers. For example, in, in this case, we have n, n uh, child controllers. This uh, parent controller will control these uh, n child controllers. And then some of the child controllers may still as, as a parent controller. For example, this one, uh, child controller n, it's all, in addition, it's a child controller, it's also a parent controller which controls this number of uh, child controllers, we can have hierarchical controllers. So each controller may contain, uh, may control one of the domains. So in, in, in this architecture, and then the super controller or parent controller uh, will, accept, uh, will, will accept or receive the request from customers or applications. And then this parent controller will split the work. And then, for example, if we uh, would like to have an uh, end-to-end tunnel. This tunnel will carry uh, the surface for some customers. The super controller will manage it to control the path, control compute the path, ask her some of its uh, child, child controllers. And then after super controller get the end-to-end -end path, and then it, it uh, can manage it to some of his ch child controllers to set up the path and then in the end, we have an end, end to pass, and then we use this end to end to pass to carry customer service. So this is the uh, hierarchical uh, controller architecture. Yeah, that's uh, uh, roughly about uh, the BGP as a central con as a central controller. So we would like to uh, comment from people here. So this is uh, Chris Bowers here. I have a question about, um, when I first looked at this, I thought based on the title that it would be, um, you know, BGP SRTE to, as the mechanism for controlling, for instantiating paths, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, um, you mean Sigma Neurality? Sigma Neurality is the sub case here. For example here, we, because here, we, this is a general architecture, and then uh, we, this general architecture can have the function for set, for example, set up the second routing tunnels, right? Mm -hmm. Here, we, uh, for example, here, uh, in this, uh, uh, so in this uh, uh, building block, we have a segment ID and a label database, and then with this information, so we can, uh, create a segment routing, a segment routing TE tunnels. Mm -hmm. For example, we can have a request for it. We can, from source to destination, we would like to have a traffic engineered segment routing tunnel. So because BGP already have a traffic engineer information, in addition to that, we also have a segment routing, segment uh, uh, ID information. So first we can compute a tunnel satisfies constraints such as TE constraints. And then after we uh, have that pass, and then we can allocate uh, those uh, segment, row, segment IDs. For example, if we use adjacency uh, segment, se se to those uh, IDs, right. so we can along those paths, each, each link or each, each interface, we can allocate uh, adjacency uh, SID. And then with those IDs, and then we can send those uh, information Adjacent ID, adjacent ID, adjacent ID, along the whole path. And then we can get all this information sent to the ingress node. So ingress node can use those segment uh, adjacent SID, adjacent SID, if we can have a segment, so, uh, uh, segment routing tunnels, right? Right, so so I'm, I'm curious, there, there are like methods that are being standardized to do that, to pass the information from a BGP controller down to an ingress node. Um, is is that is this talking about using those methods or or another method? There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just it would be good in the document to sort of clarify what method you're talking about because I think in the document it says BGP plus and R plus yeah, this extensions is, for BGP. Yeah, that's a good question. BGP, I think yeah. this is uh, uh, just the architecture. So if we already have uh, those uh, extensions, 
I mean, have a better a BGP if BGP have a better capability that we can use that one, right? If someone already have that extension. You are not referencing them. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it would be good okay. if you could go a bit more in details and explain what is it exactly you're trying to do because it completely lacks content. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. That's a good comment. Good, mm -hmm. good question. Yes. Uh, Greg, Greg um, so, um, you're suggesting that you use, uh, BGP, uh, controller to calculate traffic engineering. So are you suggesting that BGP implements, uh, constraint based, uh, SPF? Uh, why not? Because, uh, because BGP. Already... No, uh, again, that's, I wanted you to say that. Thank you. I think because uh, BGP already distributed the links to the information. Those links to the information include the traffic information, right? So it's easy. We can have a CSPF and then we can compute the traffic in your pass. And then use those paths, we can set up a either segment routing T tunnel or MPLS T tunnels. Hi, Tony Lee, Arista Networks. Um, so Everybody knows, yes, you can shove anything into BGP. Uh, I believe our catchphrase is BGP is not a dump truck. Um, there is that aspect. I don't want to go into that. Let me ask you a different question, which is what's the difference between this and PCEP? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so, uh, Using PCE, we, we in the network we need to uh, deploy PCE, another component, another protocol in the network, right? So that will increase the maintenance or whatever cost. So with BGP, because the BGP is already core component of the network, so if we have a BGP as a central controller, we can just uh, reduce a number of protocols. For example, we can reduce the BG, uh, PCE protocols. Right, that's I think uh, the one of purpose of segment routing. Right, segment routing just uh, reduce the RSVT and then re reduce the number of protocols in the network, and then customer is happy. Right. Well, customer may not be happy if you reduce all the protocols by folding them all into one. You've taken all of your complexity and shoved it into one big monster. Okay. I, th I think we will we'll, we'll allow the authors to yeah, that's a, put I more details I... in their draft. Otherwise, it's fun. Robin, we are done with comments. <laughs> So I just want to add more answer to Tony Lee. Uh, you can talk to Tony, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, okay. I mean, <laughs> and he's going to be polite, he promised. Based on the amount of content in draft, there's really nothing to discuss. It would be really good if you put more details, describe at least high level, and provide right, right reference, BGPLS to get the link state, I don't know, flow spec to configure something. Just put something in it okay, if you okay. want people yeah, to we'll put, uh, react. Those are details. Good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so next up is Jacob Heights. Uh, hello, I'm Jacob Heights from Cisco. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, automatic dis uh, discovering configuration of massive scale network, massive scale DC fabric. <clears throat> uh, I've um, had a look around to see what sizes that uh, uh, massive scale data centers are, and some are several hundred thousand servers. So I've gone with. Um, Let's go for a million servers. That should be way enough for a long time. Um, and just depending on um, how the uh, <clears throat> um, how much redundancy um, uh, you put in and uh, the oversubscription, you can have up to eight million links in such a data center. Maybe from one point five million to eight million, depending how many. Um, 
<clears throat> now we want uh, to uh, to configure the switches um, in the fabric. We want no location dependent configuration. That means no IP addresses, no tier, no southbound or northbound configs, anything like that. Um, we can have uh, configs that are not location dependent, such as a random um, number for a uh, unique device ID or unique interface IDs. <coughs> um, for scalability, no device must need complete topology information. That means um, we cannot do link states um, from every device to every other device. <coughs> um, otherwise, you've got too many. Um, no separate cabling for a management network. Some people like that, some people don't. <coughs> um, this needs to detect all cabling errors, um, not just, um, for example, um, super spine to uh, leaf uh, connections or cross pod connections, but also things like unbalanced spines, fully meshed um, super spines, that sort of thing, or anything else that you might not have in the requirement. So detect every cabling error. Um, now, uh, because um, a network will be automatically um, discovered and configured, if multiple such networks are connected together, um, the auto configuration and auto discovery should not bleed from one network into the other. It, okay. Um, if the controller is dis disconnected, oh, I forgot to say, I'm going to put a controller in this. All right. If the controller is disconnected, the network should still function. Now, I call it a controller, um, but I've had some comments offline that this is not really a controller. It doesn't do a lot. Um, it uh, does the initial configuration of the fabric only. <coughs> uh, talking about scale, <coughs> the number of links in a closed fabric scales to the same order as the number of connected servers. The SPF computation time scales higher than the order of number of links, so SPF doesn't scale. <coughs> um, uh, okay, this I went through in the previous one, uh, and that one as well. Uh, now, um, in the IDR uh, meeting, I, I gave a presentation of uh, <coughs> the only way that I know anyway um, to scale a fabric um, is to use, uh, is to aggregate the routes. Every switch in the network takes all of its um, inputs and puts out one route. One route is the aggregation um, of all of its inputs. That, doing that requires a few other things to happen. <clears throat> um, you need to uh, allocate the addresses to the switches in such a way that you can aggregate them and that can be a little bit of a hassle sometimes. Um, and um, aggregation, to, to aggregate the addresses and only send aggregates um, is difficult to do because um, if you get a link failure you get black holes. Um, so uh, in that other presentation I put in, well you need negative routes to say, well, I can't get to the failed link, um, but that also has issues because um, negative routes is not a new thing, but the solving of the issues is. Um, and that's why I need this one, the auto configuration, auto discovery and auto configuration um, to make that happen for the aggregation. Um, right, best way to do auto config is with a controller because the controller can see everything. Trying to do it distributed is very hard and error prone because um, any any node in a distributed network cannot see the whole thing and makes uh, appropriate decisions is when um, the network or the connections do not uh, comply with the requirements. <clears throat> okay, the solution. <clears throat> Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on this page, but um, basically um, the solution is uh, ZTP, a number of ZTP um, zero-touch provisioning protocols already exist. Um, 
but uh, the device to be provisioned must have connectivity to the device that's doing the provisioning. <clears throat> um, so here, uh, when we have a total network um, that's being provisioned, a lot of devices do not have connectivity to the provisioning device. So um, what I've done here is um, uh, I can build the connectivity between the device to be provisioned and the device that's doing the provisioning. <clears throat> and in order to do that, um, I've taken um, several other existing uh, technologies and glue them together uh, to make that happen. So the first thing is um, I've used uh, DHCP v6 uh, to discover the links and assign them IP addresses. Um, there's other ways. Uh, DHCP v4 could possibly do that. I just found it easier with DHCP v6 because we got router advertisements in that. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm sure it can be done with other ways, but uh, so that's one thing that I want to hear comments on. What is there? Uh, reasons why other things should be chosen. Um, the ZTP um, I've chosen here is uh, there's a draft in the NetConf working group to use NetConf Yang um, for ZTP, so I've chosen that, but again, could be, another, could be a different one. Right. Now, um, what happens here is the uh, controller, I've called it a controller, um, uses um, DHCP to configure the first device it's connected to, then configures that one to be a DHCP relay, so it can configure the next device, which again is turned into a relay, which can configure the next device, and so forth. Right. Um, I'll put BGP in there uh, in order to maintain connectivity between all of the devices and the controller, not device to device, just device to controller and controller to device. <coughs> Um, a single hop BGP sessions between the devices distribute the controller address, so the devices need to get to controller. Um, single hop BGP session between devices, they learn the connected neighbors, <coughs> or more to the point, if the connected neighbors fail. <coughs> controller has multi hop BGP sessions to devices. So there's two types of BGP connections. There's point-to-point -point and there's a multi-hop to the controller. <clears throat> devices know how to reach the controller, but do not near know how to reach distant devices. Um, so to reach distant devices, um, we use SRV6 or actually any source routing protocol. Um, I chose SRV6 because it doesn't need to be implemented in the forwarding plane. You only need to do it in the control plane. So it's easy to do it there, but we could use other source routing protocols. <clears throat> um, and then when it's all been discovered, um, the controller compares the learned topology with the required topology. And then, uh, so that's the second stage. Um, once the connectivity is achieved. Um, it then goes ahead and configures the final configuration to put the aggregatable addresses in. <clears throat> okay, so um, here we have a gen a, some kind of generic network um, to show this. Um, so the node, okay, we have the DUT there. The DUT is some random device in the network. And you can see that um, the green nodes um, are the ones that did, that this guy knows. He doesn't know anything any further away, right? This is for scalability. He only knows how to reach his directly connected peers. Um, now the controller knows how to reach everyone, but everyone, everyone knows how to reach a controller. But this one down there that's marked in the yellow, Right, this node does not know how to reach a DUT because it's not directly connected to it. So, how does the controller get a packet to the DUT? Um, if that device does not know how to get there, 
Um, the only way is with a source routing protocol. So he has to put a source route onto that packet to get it to the DUT. So I've chosen SRV6 for that. Could be another one. <coughs> um, right. Now, um, I've used um, DHCP in order to uh, discover each of the links as the first discovery. Um, but the HCP wasn't built with that intention in mind. <clears throat> uh, so um, there's a couple of things in DHCP. Uh, with DHCP, um, you, you can request an um, IP address for lots of interfaces in a single message. Um, but then I wouldn't be able to discover the endpoints. Um, so we need a small change here. Um, if you want to use DHCP to do this, um, you can request an IP address for only one interface um, in your request message, and that is the interface on which the message is being sent. So here we have the first step. We have the controller and node A. Uh, um, it's controller wants to discover this link and assign the IP address to A. So. Uh, the device sends a solicit message, it's a DSGPV6 solicit message. Um, there are two other messages in between here, but they are not required um, with a point-to-point -point link. So we can put in the uh, rapid commit option. So with the um, with solicit message, the controller can reply straight back with a reply and the reply um, contains the IP address. Um, so there's another little piece in there, like that first message is a router advertisement um, with the M bit set to one. Um, <clears throat> so a DHCP device um, normally does not just keep on sending um, solicit messages out into the ether forever and ever. Um, eventually it stops. So one change I've made here is that as a response to a router advertisement, if a device requires an IP address, um, as a response to a router advertisement, it'll send a solicit. That's a, that's a change that is not in the in any RFC. <clears throat> right. So once it gets the um, once it gets the reply, now the controller has learnt that link, and then um, the ZTP will go ahead and find all the other links and assign them uh, IP addresses. These. Um, IP addresses are just random addresses. They have to be different. Every interface in the whole planet network has to be different, but that's all. It doesn't have to be aggregatable or whatever. This is the first step. This, the last step, it puts aggregatable addresses in, but not yet on this step. And that is because the controller does not yet know the topology, so it doesn't know what device it's talking to. Okay. <clears throat> right. Ooh. <clears throat> now here's the next device, device E. Maybe just one question on the previous slide for a second. Just the, the network endpoint table is on the controller or on the uh, device? Oh, that's on the controller. That's uh, the the controller learns um, all of the links in the whole device in the, in the whole fabric, and this is it's a link state table. On the okay. and the end controller, okay, and it's going to use that to create the like the the SRV six uh, yes stack of yes. of interface addresses to get to yes the next router. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Does a router does it does the switch also have a similar? Is it able to talk SRV six back to the controller? Or not? No. Okay. It, it, yeah, no, it, it will route back to the controller. Um, so each device, whoop, we're here. So um, so each device, the, the red line there is the uh, is the way back to the controller. Um, every device will know which interface to use to send a packet back to the controller. So the device has the controller address and all of its neighbors, but no further devices. So a device can get back to the controller. It's the controller getting to the device that needs the segment routing. Because that yellow guy 
doesn't know it. Right. Okay, and it's using like the equivalent of a stack of adjacency SIDs, which is in V6, the each interface address. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so it's just got a list of addresses to go to to get to that. Right, the second one, right? The second one's a little trickier than the first link. Um, to find the second link, uh, E sends a DHCP solicit to A. Now, A is a relay agent. Um, so in order to discover that link, we need to find both ends of the link, right? We need to, uh, so we need to DUID, device unique identifier is DHCP thing. All right from E and the IAID, that's the interface uh, address association uh, identifier, and that is an identifier that is um, unique on the device only. <clears throat> uh, so we have we have the interface identifier and the device identifier from E that is sent in the solicit message. Now. A's end is um, is a link address field in the DHCP message that will identify um, the uh, A's end of the link, and the source address of the relay forward message contains A's loopback address. So now we know both ends of the link. That information goes back to the controller. So that's routed back to the controller. <clears throat> All right. And so now the controller has that. It knows that link now. Now it can assign an address to E. Now the requirements of that address um, is that it be, it have the, uh, the same subnet number as the one on the A side. So that, right, so that the link has the same subnet on both ends of the link. But uh, the, interface identifier part, the, the low part of the address can be anything. <clears throat> so now we have an address for E. Um, and then uh, the controller starts ZTP to E and uh, discovers the rest of the interfaces on it and um, configures the device again to be a DHCP relay. Um, oh, okay, the last part there, it puts the BGP sessions on. Now these BGP sessions, they're only for discovery. It's not the final BGP sessions in the final network. All right. Um, so what happens if uh, E is configured through the bottom link and A is configured through the top link and uh, the ZTP configures all of the other interfaces of A and all the other interfaces of E, but it doesn't know about a link between A and E. Right? So it configures the wrong subnet for that interface on either side because it doesn't know they're connected. <clears throat> um, right, so here's the next um, small change. The, um, the router ID advertisement from one side will disagree uh, with the subnet address from the other side and say, aha, I got, I got the wrong subnet. You can find from the router advertisement that, hey, I got the wrong subnet. <clears throat> now, if the M bit is one, M bit is one means give me DHCP. <clears throat> um, then he says, aha, I need a new address. So he sends a solicit message um, as before. Uh, and then, of course, then the, when that gets through with the relay forward message, the controller figures out that, whoops, Gave it the wrong, gave it the wrong subnet. Gives it the proper subnet, um, and sends it back. So now we've fixed the subnet. So that's how we find the links that, the links that do not have an initial DHCP request across them. We find those links out now. Um, and with this, with this method, as this continues and it ripples through the whole of the network, um, the controller can find all of the links um, from the DHCP requests that are coming to it from all of the network. Okay. 
<clears throat> now, um, I think I went through the BGP connections, right? So this is the last thing, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, this, um, the security threats um, that uh, are, uh, apply to this <clears throat> uh, is that um, any if someone can connect a malicious device to one of the switches, any of the switches in the network, um, it can get in. It uh, nothing can access the underlay from outside through the network itself, but it has to be directly connected. Right, so um, the best security is armed guards, which they do have. But failing that, um, any device that's directly connected um, can disrupt any of the tunnels. So the you know, the tunnels that are running through the underlay um, may all use IPsec tunnels, and then that will fix that. Um, the uh, drive ITF netcom zero touch um, that has uh, security built into that um, so that can be used the TCP uh, I mean the BGP connections uh, that are running on this um, to use TCP AO um, there's a way to run netconf over SSH and there it is um, now, uh, DHCP does have an authentication option in there, uh, but the point-to-point -point called delayed authentication has been deprecated, so that's no longer there. However, it could be resurrected if needed. Um, but here, um, I found a, uh, uh, that's the last point there, I found a, um, a document that uh, describes um, a similar thing to delayed authentication um, using uh, um, what well, public private keys and that's the last slide so um, really um, some of the choices that I've made here could be made differently but basically um, what it is is to um, use ZTP to connect uh, ZTP to uh, configure all of the switches in the network and use BHCP and uh, um, the, the BGP to get connectivity between each device and the controller. Questions, comments? Sam Aldrin from Google. Um, I read through the draft multiple times. Um, I'm just wondering what exactly you're standardizing here? What am I standardizing? Um, I need a couple of different things to do to DHCP to make the DHCP piece work. I don't see that anything in the document. Okay, I'll put it in. <laughs> Um, quick question on, uh, so let's take you add a device, right? In your assumption in the draft, if the controller doesn't know that the device got added, what happens? Oh, um, uh, each, um, each device as it's configured, uh, becomes a DHCP relay agent. Um, it also sends out router, router advertisements on all of its links. Um, one of the changes I've made is um, if a device requires an address and sees a router advertisement um, with the MBIT set, um, it'll start a DHCP solicit. And sure, then, but controller doesn't know that, but doesn't have any reachability to the device. Um, what the happens? The controller has reachability to the DHCP relay agent, which is... Uh, which so, is, so what you're saying is the assumption is that controller will always have the reachability to the device. Is that right? Uh, the controller will have reachability to the um, relay agent device to which the new device is being connected. And that's when it sends the M bit to one. 
Um, another piece in the draft that I didn't put here was that if the device does not have, it fails to um, to reach a controller, it will not set its M bit. Right, and then and then what happens is that you connect a new device, um, it it will not be it will not be detected. So um, yeah, it uh, the BGP um, ensures connectivity to the controller. Um, as long as there are links, yeah. if um, if a if a device becomes totally disconnected, like partitioned away, then of course there's no um, there's no connectivity. Okay, now, uh, now, now, I can take it offline. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk. Tony, Tony Lee, Arista Networks. <clears throat> um, I like this, but I can't help wondering if it wouldn't be simpler to enable routing incrementally as you went. Um, right. Um, the yellow guy, right? Um, the yellow guy doesn't know how to reach a DUT because um, each device knows only its immediately connected neighbors. And I've done that for <coughs> scalability. I mean, you, you could run ISIS or something in the whole um, network, but that wouldn't scale. Well, hang on for a second. Isn't the MSDC going to eventually run some flavor of routing? Oh yes, um, that was um, my uh, uh, the draft I presented to the IDR um, uh, interim um, using aggregated um, using using BGP aggregation. So uh, was it uh, RFC seven nine three eight? Or I hope I got the number right. Um, so why not deploy that incrementally? It seems like you would save yourself having to mess with SR. Um, so are you saying to put the aggregatable addresses in in the beginning? Why not? Oh, yeah, um, because the controller doesn't yet know. Before it's discovered um, only a few devices, it doesn't yet know what it's talking to. It doesn't know where what the final addresses should be until it learns at least a very sizable part piece of the topology. Um, okay, but wouldn't it be better if the, or the the controller had some idea of what it was doing beforehand? That would be nice, but it doesn't have to. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, where uh, which device you're going to connect the controller to several devices within the network? Um, but it doesn't have to know which devices it's being connected to. Now, um, if you want to do that, if you want to put the uh, um, previous information in that in that it knows what it's connecting to first, then fine. We can put the final addresses in uh, in the first step. Uh, yeah, we could we could do that, but we don't have to. Yes, Igor. Hey, can you tell me what MSDC in the right mind doesn't have a topology defined ahead of trying to bring up a network? <laughs> like, sorry, uh, I <laughs> I run an MSDC. Um, uh, I run a network. I have a controller that does something like this on the out of band network because we predefine the topology. We predefine the topology because we predefine a wiring plan. We predefine a wiring plan because we have to lay out a fiber infrastructure throughout the entire data center. All of this is predefined. We don't need any discovery like this. We will program it out of band because when shit hits the fan, and holy shit, well, shit hit the fan, you need an out of band network to fix the in band network. Why do this? You could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Igor, Yahoo, Oath, Verizon, uh, whichever label you want to assign. But yeah, I. So we run data center topologies with over 100,000 physical servers right now uh, in a cloud, cloud, in a multi dimensional folder cloud network. We have controller that pre configures everything, that deploys configs. We've given a talk at Nana, going exactly how we do this, uh, both on the controller side and. Uh, Telemetry, etc. We 
don't let devices arbitrarily configure themselves. Again, we have a topology plan. You have to have a topology plan in MSDC. I don't understand why you need to do this step-by-step -step discovery thing. Um, yeah, is, uh, I would like to. Cisco yeah. systems. Uh, can you go on? You say you have a topology plan. Do you use aggregatable addresses like we're trying to use now? Yes. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would like to talk to you more well, about that. Summarized aggregatable. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we have a controller that will verify whether topology plan matches reality of wiring because we find X percentage of stuff is miswired by. You know, shit happens, and we. The corrective action isn't to hand out a different IP address. The corrective action is to make somebody wired according to the plan. Again, uh, you have a plan; you stick to it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, do you connect the controller to the devices with the management port? Uh, I connect the controller to the devices on both in band and out of band because I need redundancy for that. So initial configuration would come over the outer band. At that point, my agents get dropped uh, onto the So that's separate switches. wiring. What? There's it's separate wiring out of, out of band. When you say out of band, it's, it's, yeah, it's, not, I, it's not in the same wires. Right? I find it very – so the controller is capable of talking both in band and out of band. It actually uh -huh. does it over both because when ZTP occurs – you grab the config, you grab the initial bootstrap, and then you connect to the control over whichever channel you have. We prefer it to happen over the outer band because that means in-band doesn't need to be up. But if you were to do it over in-band only, you would basically device one, everything connected to device one, everything connected to the next ring, and it would build out in rings out. Perfectly capable of doing that on in-band only. It just it doesn't need a whole protocol to do this. I, I, like, yeah. I, I, who's the customer that's asking for this is what I don't understand because this seems like the wrong way to configure your network. Okay, I'd like to talk to you more uh, when we have more time. Uh, so the, the aim here is that you do not need to configure any position-dependent information into any device before you put it in the network that you can take a device out of the network, um, uh, fix it, put it back in, and it'll come up again. You can so, put it back, you can, yes? Correct me if I'm wrong, the way DHCP works, and I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong here, is that you will need to have a MAC address that is somehow mapped to the system identifier, because that's how you're going to hand it a config, uh, which means that you already have said, this MAC address is in position X. That is effective. That is what you do. In any large MSDC, what you actually have is you have a wiring plan, yeah. a, a topology, a model, and then you're saying nothing more than MAC address X, which happens to be this switch that I'm dropping in, goes right in this slot. And then everything is configured around that. And if you put a different switch in that slot? Then MAC address, well, if I put a different switch in that slot, that switch will not come up because it doesn't match my model. My model says MAC address X goes right here. Again, in any large MSDC, we, the architecture team, yeah. will design how things are, and it better be that way because any deviation in a large-scale network is unacceptable and simply gets deconfigured. Um, okay, so what I'm doing here is um, as long as it's the same type of switch, right, it doesn't matter which one it is, you can put any of those switches into that hole and put the wires in, in into any hole in the wires, and the control will figure that out, figure out where in, the, where in the topology it is, find out what is the proper configuration to put on that, and we'll put that on there. I, again, operationally, I'm wondering what MSDC would do that, because that seems unwise. That's like saying you can put any server randomly into any position of the data center, which is just not how things are done. Like your inventory management system keep track of everything. Like in a data center, you need to know, like in a large data center, where things are. Yeah. You need to know how they're wired up, both power and network, because you're going to be doing power management. You're going to be doing cooling management. You're doing network topology and traffic management. 
you need to know where everything is. Randomness is just not how things are done. Well, the controller will know where everything is once it finds it. The controller isn't supposed to find it. The controller is supposed to tell or program where things are according to your plan. I think that's the disagreement, and that's why I'm wondering, do you have any large MSDCs that are saying they want to randomly spray shit all over their data center? Because that's what this sounds like. <laughs> no, it's not. Ra we're not randomly spraying shit all over the data center. Right? What I'm saying here is that you have two identical switches. You can put one switch in that hole or the other switch in that hole, and it won't make any difference. Once sure. the disco when the when the controller discovers it, then you'll know where they all are. Now, um, so so having having to say, I got two identical switches here. I'm going to have to put this in that hole, and I have to put this in that hole, and if I mix them up, it's not going to work. No, what's actually going to happen is that you're going to take two random switches. You're going to put one of them into a cabinet. You're going to roll the cabinet in. You're going to plug it in. You're going to take a, some form of a scanner, and you're going to go beep, 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 beep down the whole thing. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know exactly this is this switch, this MAC address. All these servers are plugged in into these exact positions, these exact ports. And at that point, that goes to your operational database of some form. And then your controller reads that and goes, oh, switch X, Mac ID Y is sitting right here. This is how you program it. This is the last time. It's a great discussion. It could go forever. But AC Land of Cisco Systems, I can see what you're saying. And it does make things a lot simpler to manage if you do have this out-of-band management. If you're an MSDC, you have to have it. So if you're designing this for an MSDC. Okay, well that's, so then we have the wrong requirement. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, to have, have something that does it does everything in band, it does the zero touch. I mean, whether it does it in band or out band doesn't matter. Random. No, it makes it, it makes it simpler if you have the out of band. <laughs> it does, but you can do what I'm describing in band only. The difference is it's not random, it's not discover post back. Okay, fine. I, I, I hear you, I hear you, Igor, and um, I'm open to changes and to hear what you have to say, and I'd love to do that. And actually, anybody else in the group, too. Um, Thank you. Okay, I'll see you after. Thanks, Jake. And uh, our ID is here, so after reading the document, definitely doesn't belong in ADR. It has nothing to do with BGP as such. Uh, if we continue working, and I think this, working group is better place. It's my personal opinion. Obviously, Martin, it would be up to you to. Well, the thing is I've put several pieces in. It's not just BGP. I actually, I named the that's document my, that's IDR. My point. Huh? That's my point. It doesn't really belong in IDR. Sorry, it does not do. Belong in IDR. It belongs in IDR. No, it doesn't. Oh, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, actually, I, you know, I named, I put the IDR into the name of the document, which is a mistake. It doesn't matter how you named it. It's a wider architectural document. It's not ID. Where do you think it belongs? Probably here. If we okay, okay, that's why I'm standing here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And talk to you. Hmm? Talk to Igor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so next up is Sanjay Wadwa. So do you want protocol requirements first? Yeah, or no, no, not that one. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Thanks. So we uh, presented uh, 
a framework and an architecture for CUPS, uh, control plane and user plane separation on BNG in uh, the last ITF. So I think one of the actions, or at least the action that we thought uh, the group presented was before we get into protocol selection, let's put a set of comprehensive requirements for the protocol between the control plane and user plane. Uh, so we did that. It's a uh, uh, work jointly done between vendors and, uh, and some of the providers. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to go over every one of the requirements, but at least the key musts that we see, uh, we'll try to go over those. So very quickly, if you look at a BNG, which is your broadband network gateway at edge of the network, uh, I won't get into reasons why CUPS, we have done that as part of the framework, but if you decompose it, then your control plane running as a virtual network function runs the subscriber management control plane only. Essentially, DHCP, PPP, authentication, if you have L2TP, uh, accounting, credit control, and things like that. All your routing, MPLS, uh, BFD, that stays local to your UP or your user plane. And uh, of course, one model is where you have a lot of distributed BNGs at remote locations, but you want to centralize the control plane running as a VNF. So more often than not, you may have a layer three network multi-hop between your UP user plane devices and your control plane. Let me skip a few slides ahead. So here, at least our goal, as we stated last time as well, is to look at different deployment models for BNG, which are evolving, uh, and see that if we can do CUPS or this control and user plane separation in a uniform way, irrespective of how the BNG is deployed. So one thing we observe is that BNG is becoming more multi-access, where you could have, which is you know the common model today, you have a fixed access network from the CPE, uh, you have your access nodes going to the BNG, and more often than not, this is a dot one Q or Q and Q. So you know, it's a layer two network. Of course, you can have different forms of layer two over layer three tunneling, layer two over GRE, VXLAN, MPLS pseudo wire, but essentially you have layer two being backhauled to your BNG. What we are now seeing also is that providers are looking at uh, 5G millimeter wave, for instance, as your last mile. So you want to basically do a fixed wireless type model where instead of an access node, now you have a RAN that your access is over. And your BNG is still terminating that fixed wireless access and doing the same type of subscriber management here, the functions that I just called out earlier. But in that case, your access is not your VLAN tags or a layer two over layer three tunnel, but it is a GTPU tunnel, for instance. So ideally, when we look at CUPS, we want to solve that as well. And finally, of course, you can have hybrid access where either you want resiliency uh, for wireless connection to back your fixed connection or higher aggregate bandwidth, for instance, where you're not upgrading from copper to fiber. So in that case, you're terminating both accesses on the BNG, and we want CUPS to work in that model as well. So then very quickly, if you look at the three interfaces we defined last time as part of the architecture, you need a state control interface between the control CP and UP. What this does is essentially, as the subscriber management control plane runs, authenticates the subscriber, assigns an address, it would use this interface to program your hardware BNG, for instance, or your user plane uh, on, for, with its data plane state. So that is the state control interface. In-band signaling for fixed, if you keep fixed wireless aside, is invariably always in-band. So your signaling messages from your CPE show up to the UP. You want to tunnel them, uh, if this is, for instance, a layer three network to your control plane, and then the return messages need to be tunneled back through the UP to your CPE. So there's a need for an in-band control plane working both with layer two and layer three between the CP and the UP. And the last one is the management interface. We're not focused at least yet on the draft on this, but that is future, we will do that. But this is essentially a single point for management and control. So you need a management interface for both config and state uh, between the CP and the CP VNF and the UP. So then quickly looking at the requirements, uh, again, I'm zipping through because of uh, time, uh, but basically your baseline state control interface, and then we broke it into extensibility, in-band control channel, scalability and performance, 
transport protocol used for this CUPS protocol, resiliency and security. So if we look at the state control uh, interface, again, it's a busy slide. So I'll just, uh, you know, call out the key ones. So of course, the basic function of this particular protocol here or the state control interface is to download the forwarding state, state related to traffic management, your ACLs, your, you know, SLA, SLA management uh, from the CP to the UP. And again, ideally this protocol must work for fixed, fixed wireless and hybrid access. Then of course your subscribers can be your IPOE subscribers or PPPOE subscribers where PPPOE could be terminated or tunneled to a retail uh, gateway on the other side. But also one key thing is, like I said before, your transport could be diverse, right? It could be ethernet, it could be L2 over L3 with L2 over GRE, VXLAN or an MPLS pseudo wire. So given all this variance that you see, you want to make sure a control plane can work with a different vendor's UP implementation. So it's not that from the control plane you take lookup tables and dump it onto a UP. So what you need is a flexible set of uh, match rules and actions where you can say match this subscriber or this slash 32 and go program your forwarding state, uh, you know, encapsulate or decapsulate or do NAT or just route. So essentially what you want to do is not dump lookup tables directly based on a vendor implementation of a UP but you need a definition or a language where you are specifying it in terms of forwarding rules or match rules plus actions. So that I think is a key for this, uh, for this CUPS protocol. Uh, what else? Okay. Uh, besides then just the state, the forwarding state, we also need the routing state for the subscriber. So if you're aggregating a subscriber subnet and announcing it into routing upstream, you want to pass that aggregate route from CP to the UP. If you're giving out the gateway IP in DNS, you want to pass that gateway IP address. So it's not just forwarding plus traffic management, but also related to subscriber routing and IP interface state. And then of course your quas state, and we see at least in fixed networks, a hierarchy where you manage traffic to the CP or control the amount of traffic to the CP, but also to the access node. So there's a hierarchy. So you need the protocol to be able to indicate from CP to the UP what hierarchy this CP or subscriber belongs to, right? For instance, this CP is behind this access node. Uh, you definitely need some kind of liveness detection between CP and UP based on periodic heartbeats. Uh, want to quickly detect if one goes down. Uh, and then in terms of just messages and events, we need asynchronous session level event notifications from UP to CP. For instance, reporting periodic usage, which the CP may then, you know, do radius accounting at interim updates. So your periodic reporting of usage, your threshold based reporting of usage, uh, inactivity timeout, if you have programmed. So these are UP to CP level events. Uh, also subscriber unreachability detection. For instance, you may from CP, uh, essentially issue a directive to see if this subscriber is reachable. And once the UP detects a subscriber is unreachable, you need a notification. So you need session level notification, session being a subscriber session, uh, but you also need node level asynchronous notifications. For instance, if one UP switches over to another UP or a redundancy domain on a UP switches over because of a failure of a port or a group of ports, then you want to be able to notify that event to the CP so CP can download your subscriber state to your other UP. Uh, I have already done this. So just in terms of extensibility, this is really key here for the CUPS protocol. Uh, you want to define the information elements that you encode in the protocol as TLVs. So these should not be just you know, fixed format messages. Uh, uh, you should always be able to define additional information elements in existing messages. Uh, but also should be able to define new information in existing TLV. So this is all under the umbrella of, you know, how do you define TLVs for extensibility? And you definitely here need vendor specific uh, TLVs as well, where you can partition your type space and leave a certain space for, uh, you know, vendor specific extensions. 
Uh, and finally, graceful handling of unknown TLVs. If you have non-mandatory TLVs that the CP sends to the UP, then you need, to need a graceful way of handling those on the UP where it can ignore the non-mandatory ones, for instance. Coming quickly to the in-band signaling channel uh, requirements. So one key thing that you need here is that the CUPS protocol that you're defining should be able to set up the control channel between the UP and CP to transport the in-band signaling I mentioned before, DHCP and PPP, for instance, because all your signaling is coming into the UP, so it has to use the in-band control channel uh, to send it to the CP. Uh, okay. Uh, you need the UP when it receives a signaling message to essentially signal a layer two circuit ID, which port with which VLAN tags or which tunnel or pseudo wire the control message came in on. It needs to signal that to the CP. So when CP sends the response back, it can build a message and address it to that right L2 circuit or L2 access ID. Uh, one key thing here is you need to be able to pass the whole ethernet frame that you received with the signaling message but also in the fixed wireless scenario where you have a GDP U tunnel, your DHCP V4 and V6 messages themselves come over a GDP U tunnel. And GDP U, it's an IP payload. So your in-band control channel must be able to pass both IP and layer two PDUs up to the CP and vice versa. Uh, another key aspect is that this control channel must give you the capability for CP to specify which control packets it wants. Uh, also, priorities for control packets. For instance, prioritizing renews over discovers or pre uh, prioritizing keep alives that go back and forth. So just the notion of uh, CP telling the UP, I need these messages with these priorities. And in case of overload, you want to be able, the CP should be able to control, uh, tell the UP the rate or vice versa. So overload management as well. So the short here or the net is that your control channel must be dynamic. It's not like a static, you know, let's say a VXLAN tunnel, but something that the CP sets with the UP indicating which protocols it wants at what rate and what priority. So that becomes important here as well. Then looking at scalability and performance, I think this one is uh, obvious that you want to minimize the latency to bring up subscribers. Your CP may be centralized dealing with you know, hundreds of these uh, small BNG nodes, which are fairly distributed. So across this whole cup system, you can have a lot of subscribers. So especially when you're, there are events which trigger a lot of subscriber bring up or tear down within a short period of time, you want to reduce the latency uh, for the subscriber to log in. Uh, one key thing is we want to limit the chattiness here to bring up a subscriber. I think that is a key here where ideally when you're bringing up a subscriber, you have the VLAN information, you have, you know, let's say encapsulation with PPP, you have that, you have IPv4, IPv6, you have your cost information. So you want to collect all that on the CP and send a single request response message as opposed to these individual messages or multiple round trips, because that latency can kill you here. So definitely uh, minimize the chattiness here and, uh, you know, whatever protocol we choose should allow, allow that. Uh, overload I already mentioned. Then the other thing is your UPs to the CUP system and can increase as your number of subscribers increase or number of ports on a UP increase. Now your load on the control plane will increase. So you want to make sure your control plane VNF can scale out. And your protocol that you choose should allow that load balancing of the control plane load and scale out. For instance, it may be an initial message in the protocol going to a load balancing entity which tells you a way to reach the right you know, CP resource and as you scale out. So that again becomes uh, key here. Uh, and then where, where possible, we want to optimize the amount of information passed in the messages. For instance, if your forwarding state or your cost state is same across a group of sessions, then you want to pass these things by reference once you have created these based on an initial message. Uh, just in terms of transport protocol, uh, so one key th thing we are looking at here is that the CUPS protocol must not suffer from any head of line blocking. Uh, ideally, it should preserve message boundary with datagram semantics, so this looks more like a UDP option here. 
it should be of course easily implementable on a stack on you know simple forwarding devices but of course the protocol itself if it's using udp needs to transport it must support reliability of message exchange via request response and retransmissions so ideally no head of line blocking uh, you know datagram uh, semantics and then build reliability at the protocol level rather than the transport level uh, quickly looking at resiliency you want of course one is to one and ideally n is to m up level redundancy you want your cp to be redundant as well i mean there's a lot of bunch of detail in the draft so i'm not going over here but the net is you need redundancy for both entities uh security we'll spend more time on this but right now we're just saying this must be compatible with the proven mechanisms uh such as you know tls or dtls or ipsec but again the notion of you know security domains where within the same domain you may not do anything but across security domains you want may want ipsec or uh, tls or dtls uh and then last one here uh protocol selection input so if you look at uh, 3gpp today for packet gateways they've defined a protocol in 29244 which is called packet forwarding control protocol it's proven in the field but more importantly it has been extended over time to different type of forwarding constructs and devices so it works for a s gateway uh, where your forwarding is teid to teid it works for a packet gateway where it is teid to an ip address or a tdf where it's an ip to an ip so that's proven in the field to be very extensible it's a pretty extensive protocol machinery uh but the way it is built it is fairly extensible so it has tlvs for messages and such uh so our recommendation here is that we can look at extending this for bng cups as well one difference of course is that with bng your access is layer 2 whereas for mobile uh it is of course uh, layer 3 with gdp and also signaling in bng we need the in band signaling whereas mobile it's out of band today right your gdp tunnel gets set up before anything else happens so but those extensions if you look at it it's fairly reasonable but you get this whole protocol machinery that's well defined and proven uh and it does define tlvs which where the number space is partitioned between vendor specific and standard 3gpp so the vendor specific ones we can extend for bng uh and the benefit of course is uh, you don't uh, reinvent the wheel you extend what's there which is already proven and it will work for the bng both all for all the different topologies whether it's fixed fixed wireless or hybrid so i mean i think next steps uh, that we would at least want to do is add more details on requirement for the man management interface that i didn't talk about and then lastly uh, define protocol extensions ie extension new ies to realize bng cups with pfcp so that's pretty much the requirements draft okay so so i i did want to clarify one thing you made made the comment a number of times like protocol selection or protocol choice I and mean, it's not clear to me that the routing area working group has been tasked with selecting a protocol here um you know we were asked by the broadband forum to focus on these specific drafts in their first liaison yeah but then there was a subsequent liaison from the you know convergence work group in the broadband forum which is essentially saying that look we are trying to integrate fixed broadband with 5g for instance and there is work happening between 3gpp and broadband forum there is study document going back and forth and the expectation is that will have some bng related changes to cups mm -hmm. that's already defined and based on that you know we could see how much of that can so be there, used there's subsequent liaison though yeah it's pretty clear that you know they have yet to perform a feasibility study yeah. and in, until yeah. so until we're told otherwise i think they're not asking us to choose a protocol true so that's why we are calling it a candidate we are not saying <laughs> that this is i mean right. we're just so, saying we are making our case here we are saying this makes sense and here's why so i i agree with you bbf can uh you know we in uh can i can i okay uh, ning zhong huawei uh just a quick question for clarification because 
uh, you mentioned that actually the protocol is called uh, uh, PFCP, right? Actually, mm -hmm. it's owned by 3GPP. Okay, sure. so now you ask for IETF to do the extension of 3GPP protocol here, or what? What? What kind of work? Or get back to I, uh, a 3GPP to get some uh, get get more approval? Or so what, there are what? cases here, right? Like there's a fixed wireless which squarely belongs to 3GPP, and yeah. BBF is working with 3GPP yeah. on that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there's also a pure fixed BNG, yeah. where what we are saying is you have this protocol defined. Is there a way to reuse it? And the protocol, it's written in a way where it allows you to extend the information elements. And it has a number space that is partitioned uh, for vendor specific. So IETF or BBF could be a vendor once that study is complete and folks agree that this is the way to go. I mean, our goal is to not reinvent you know, what has been done and proven. Uh, and ideally, we want the BNG to be able to be multi-access, should be able to handle fixed, fixed wireless and hybrid. So, 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 I just want to clarify. I, I'm, I'm not understand you quite a lot. I think that what what we want ITF to do uh, discuss the protocol e extension. Oh, correct. Because 3GPP will not look at the fixed BNG, right? Okay. Their purview is fixed wireless, but okay. we want to use a single protocol because your BNG is a multi-access device, and so those extensions, oh. assuming BBF and 3GPP agree that this is the way to go, then those extensions, those bits and bytes, information elements, we can do okay. it here. Okay, so you want to uh, do some uh, CGP protocol to see, okay, what well, can be applied here in ITF to uh, really apply to the, the list. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. By the way, 3GPP, David. this is precedent there as well. Mobile IP is defined here, used by 3GPP. Uh, diameter credit control is defined here, used to an OCS in 3GPP. So there is already cooperation between ITF and 3GPP. Yeah, okay, because I, I also heard you say take it to the list, so. <laughs> no, so you are the BBF lads. And I, yeah, okay, so Dave Sinecrope Erickson, I'm speaking with the um, broadband forum liaison manager hat on. Um, so pretty much what Sanjay was saying is the case. There's work um, on fixed only architecture where the BNG just aggregation uh, is detailed. That's a TR384, I think it is. Um, but, and that was liaised to the IETF back in March. And I think that's the first liaison. What didn't, what's been subsequently liaised is the work from the wireless wireline convergence group that's now dealing with 3GBP. The BBF has not consolidated this work yet. And I think if what, we're trying to do here is come out with a unified set of protocol that can deal with the whole shooting match. The requirements for that need to be sorted out in BBF first. So we and take then some liaised in, in well conjunction. I'm sorry. And then liaised here, um, you know, once that work is done. Sure. They, Any time frame? Well, I mean, optimistically, they have their next meeting is the beginning of December, but. No, there's no, no expression on my year. colleague's face over here as to whether that'll happen. All right, the laughing is indicative of no, um, but soon after that, I would think. Thank you. Okay. Uh, George Karajanis, I'm actually also involved in, in BBF activities um, and also discussed the uh, second liaison actually that has been sent from BBF to ITF. Could, could you uh, repeat where are you from? I got your name, but not your... Huawei. Huawei, okay. Yeah. Um, so the um, the main, uh, say, goal of the liaison was to emphasize that uh, we'll be in a, in a stadium of starting requirements uh, for feasibility analysis to identify whether um, requirements could be, uh, say, derived for having an interface for a common for a control plane user plane separation for both uh, type of scenarios. Um, that is not clear whether you know these requirements could be useful to uh, to be for both uh, type of uh, scenarios. So that is not clear yet. Um, what is clear, anyway, is that if we would like to um, to focus on a fixed mobile convergence scenario, then the solutions that you are proposing, it would be ready, I think, in release 17. 
meaning that uh, companies that would like to have a solution as soon as possible for the fixed, net, uh, uh, fixed network access will have to wait until uh, 2021, 2022. Sorry. So just a quick response to that. 3GPP is not going to look at a fixed BNG. It's for BBF to see what is being done there for cups for say fixed wireless, for instance, can be used here. And if I'm not mistaken, fixed wireless is part of 3GPP release 16 or is supposed yes, to be. Yes, but, uh, but not the um, uh, control plane, users plane separation coming from the fixed mobile convergence. Will not come in the release 16, that's for sure. Okay, but so then it will come in release 17. Uh, and then we'll have to wait no. until 2021 to have a solution. Sorry, uh, while fixed network, fixed network, uh, uh, say uh, carriers want to have the solution. Now, I think right? we run out of time. Yeah. But again, I don't quite see it that way. Fixed wireless cups is part of 3GPP release 16. That's my understanding. Andrew Dolgan on Nokia. Since I almost got hit, I think I deserve a little bit of the mic. Uh, I think we have to fundamentally answer this. Uh, we have a router sitting in a network. We're going to have a, a mobile core uh, setting the data path for it as part of its separation. We're going to have a fixed core of some sort setting that we want to have a converge. The three of those will happen. There will be deployments that they will mix it. There will be deployments that will be either fixed or either mobile. I think from our perspective, I don't think we want to have three protocols, three things, and uh, managing that router and uh, otherwise it will be just now you're talking 21 that will be like 2030 uh, before we get this working and I think the value here is that it's simplistically to say that so oh, I'm, I'm, gonna cutting, work I'm cutting off the discussion have, here because yeah, uh, Don excuse do. me excuse me yeah. I'm cutting off the discussion here because we're cutting into Don's time sure so let's let's move on to the next presentation here and uh, give Don the floor. Thank you, guys. I converted it to a PDF so that hopefully we won't have any. Otherwise, then both. Okay. Uh, maybe it was. Uh, well, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it's for sure. Okay. Okay. So I'm Donald Eastlake with Huawei. Uh, so I have a much simpler presentation. <laughs> a lot of uh, technical details uh, um, for uh, these drafts that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think we're presented at the last IETF, and you're welcome to go look at them all there. Um, I think so, similarly. Technical details were presented on the uh, Wadwood drafts at the last IETF. So here's this uh, set of of drafts that are uh, all have the string CUSPDT in them, and uh, here's sort of an amalgamated list of authors. So these drafts are effectively the result of a sort of an informal design team uh, consisting of uh, Huawei, uh, China Mobile, ZTE, and to some extent participation by others. And uh, this is what uh, the drafts what they've come up with. So uh, these drafts are all to support the Broadband Forum TR384, which is a final document issued by the Broadband Forum uh, and has to do with supporting fixed network access. And on this slide, there's a URL, so everybody's welcome to go look at these, look at this uh, TR. And uh, this TR provides for control and user plane separation. And uh, I think it should be noted, this is uh, something from the BBF, which does architectures and things like this. But the BBF does not do protocols. So to the extent that this architecture requires some protocol that uh, isn't uh, you know, specifically defined for that, that somebody has to specify that protocol. So I'm just going to do a little bit of the architecture. This shows uh, <clears throat> you know, a uh, network, uh, a cloud broadband network uh, gateway. And it shows the control plane and some multiple user planes, some of the functions that uh, the uh, control plane gets access to, the AAA radius diameter servers and DHCP and so forth. And um, one of the goals of this is it virtualizes things to improve scalability, uh, economy. Uh, you can uh, pull out services faster by having things be virtualized rather than physical and 
so on and so forth. And you notice there's this sort of uh, for the three. This you know diagram shows three user planes. So there's triple lines going down. There's three of these of these lines. And this one kind of shows what each of those three lines is from the control plane to the user plane. These, this is corresponds to the TR384 architecture, you know, the service interface, the control interface, and the management interface. And uh, just uh, won't go into any uh, unnecessary detail, I don't think. The, the control interface assumes a customer user separation protocol, uh, which doesn't, you know, there's currently not a, uh, you know, sort of a, a standard for that as such. Um, so this is also a, a more uh, disaggregated uh, diagram of the broadband network gateway showing more detail of some of the subcomponents and so forth that can be virtualized in various ways. So uh, there are these liaisons which were mentioned in the previous uh, talk and I uh, want to be careful what I say about them. There's uh, URLs to liaisons here so people are also welcome to go and read the liaisons and see what they say. And this initial liaison was uh, simply uh, a little bit after the issuance of TR384, which uh, basically said that the, the things in quotes here are cut and pasted from the liaison. Uh, currently, the ITF standards work on the interfaces of this aggregated uh, BNG is started. Gives uh, actually, for example, lists actually lists two drafts in the original liaison. If you go back, and said that they look forward to continued IETF progress on drafts for the uh, interfaces of this disaggregated BNG. And this is the second liaison. You can also go look in that, read it if you want, which uh, basically says that there is this other work going on, uh, fixed uh, mobile convergence. And, um, you know, you can read this stuff. Basically, it's there's work going, which will at some point presumably produce uh, a, an architecture, requirements, uh, so on and so forth. But that, uh, and, and this could possibly result in some changes, but, you know, almost every protocol evolves and changes. Uh, but that they haven't, you know, actually decided on the feasibility of doing these things, uh, including the uh, uh, getting something which will satisfy both the fixed and mobile. So this is basically just a thing, a sort of a notification. There is future work going on, and uh, as yet, there isn't, uh, you know, an approved uh, BBF uh, broadband forum way of doing this sort of stuff, and that this uh, sort of uh, fixed mobile convergence stuff typically happens in. 3GPP. So uh, these are the, the drafts again, and uh, these drafts are are being worked on, and uh, they do provide uh, in the protocol draft here, uh, one sort of in the middle, uh, a solution that supports this fixed network case, and um, a couple of these drafts have been gone through extensive editorial revision recently. They say there's continuing work. All the drafts probably could use further polishing in various ways, certainly editorially. Um, and these, uh, this protocol this, uh, that's specified in this the protocol draft was uh, successfully used at the hackathon at the IETF 102. Uh, you have to really have the protocol draft in conjunction with the information model draft because they refer to each other and so forth. And there are, in fact, uh, trial deployments of this uh, protocol. And so there's uh, some customer usage and so forth. So uh, the question is what should be done with this? This is uh, work that I'm sure would be improved by going through the IETF process, um, but uh, not in the sense of you know, getting more polished drafts, getting uh, better review by IETF directorates and so forth would result in, in some improvement in various ways and, you know, security, et cetera. Um, this is stuff which is, I think, in use, and I, I believe that there are people who want to work on this, the, this polishing and sort of getting the stuff up to the uh, level that would be necessary for an RFC. There are people who want to use uh, this protocol. Uh, and so how should we proceed on this? So uh, reading these... Uh, liaisons, the two liaisons referred to here. Uh, some people looking at those believe there's some, you know, it's not, not necessarily crystal clear, especially when you try to look at both liaisons, exactly what uh, the, the message is uh, in aggregate. So the uh, question is, how should we move forward on this? So I believe, and maybe we can 
determine uh, to some extent uh, from the people in the room or on the mailing list that there are people in the ITF who want to work on this uh, draft CSPDT uh, CU separation BNG protocol and related the related drafts to support TR384. I believe that if we worked on that, the work would be completed quickly. I mean, this protocol is already in uh, trial deployment and so forth. And there's, there are drafts. It's not like something has to be written from scratch or uh, gone through some big cycle or whatever. I believe there are carriers who want to use that protocol for fixed network. I mean, this is a fixed network uh, protocol. So, uh, and uh, that if this is true and there's a feeling that we need a clearer liaison from the broadband forum, then what we should do is send liaison to BBF uh, saying that from the IETF, well, from this working group or whatever, however it's the right source of the IETF, saying that it, there are people who want to work on it, there are people who want to use it, and we want to know whether there's objections from the other end. So my feeling is that if there are people who want to work on it, it's already in a fairly complete state, and there are people who want to use it, and there's no objection from the broadband forum, then we should do it. You know, if those conditions don't hold, then obviously that's a different matter. So that's my presentation. Dave, any comments? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, uh, speaking from the point of view of the BBF liaison manager, I think sending that liaison would be a good idea. I mean, if nothing else, it'll get some clarity back from BBF, hopefully. Chen Qiangli from China Mobile. Uh, some comments uh, and information. From China Mobile, uh, at this time, what we need is, uh, is the uh, uh, control play and user play separated PNG for the fixed uh, network access. Uh, as presented by my colleagues in the previous meetings, uh, we already uh, have the uh, reference impl uh, implementations, uh, including uh, Jinqiang from China Mobile. And uh, 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 those, uh, those reference uh, implementations are from uh, multiple vendors, including uh, Huawei, ZTE, uh, H3C. Uh, and uh, uh, we have already done some uh, uh, tests, uh, both in our uh, lab and uh, in our uh, field network. Uh, the test uh, results show that uh, those uh, reference implementations uh, work well, and uh, uh, they can uh, satisfy uh, our requirements, both uh, the performance and the functionality. So, uh, uh, so at present, I think uh, the ATF should focus on uh, on the fixed network for the uh, uh, control play and user play separate PNG. Uh, for the FFC, I think it is a totally different uh, uh, story. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the architecture uh, is being done uh, at BBF. So uh, uh, I think uh, I'm happy to uh, to work together with Nokia uh, at BBF to develop the architecture for the FMC and then discuss the uh, the protocols for uh, for the FMC uh, scenario, uh, where to, uh, to 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 defend the suitable. Uh, uh, protocol protocols for the interfaces. That's it. Uh, Wim Hendrix, Nokia. Uh, I think it's a good idea to send a liaison to, to BBF because I think that uh, needs to happen. But I also believe, and I repeated myself from the last uh, ITF, is that uh, I think we have a, I, if we rush too fast into the fixed, we have a lost opportunity to solve the FMC use case. And I think if we can work together in BBF to speed up the requirements for FMC use cases be, together with the, with the fixed side, we could actually serve a good uh, course for, for the industry in my view. Mm. So I, re I recommend that we probably speed up the work to get the requirements for FMC clarified in BBF as soon as possible, so that in the next ITF we can actually work and get those requirements in and then see whether which protocol is the best way forward uh, to solve uh, this problem space. Because uh -huh. FMC or fixed, at the end of the day, we, sh we should not come up with two different protocols for 
by similar use cases at the end of the day. I guess I disagree that uh, the completion of these documents, which are already in this advanced state and which are already, uh, you know, documents something which is already in use, would have any significant effect on the timing of subsequent efforts. And just to comment, yeah. it's up to the BBF to to see whether he can uh, accommodate that. Well, I was just commenting on the timing yeah. and saying I don't and I don't think that due to doing what I was suggesting will actually significantly affect the timing of subsequent efforts. Uh, Andrew Logan and Nokia. Uh, first of all, I'll second what uh, Wim said. Uh, we should send this uh, liaison. We should uh, specify things. I don't think we want to mix, again, FMC from only broadband, uh, only fix, because uh, I think we want solution that fixes both in one. I also don't like a, a pseudo rush here, because uh, for those who don't read this, uh, just go please and read this version versus previous version versus previous version. I've done 15 years of coding protocols. Uh, the amount of changes between the drafts will tell to those who write software in, or wrote software in their life uh, how stable uh, the solution is. The amount of changes is insane. Uh, which is good because it's moving, but trying to suggest that this is done or even close to done is is probably a little premature. Um, you know, without detailed reading, there is fundamental issues in the in the draft from protocol level that needs to be solved. So I think we need a solution. We have to take time to actually design it well and have a protocol that actually works. Not a demo, but works. Uh, I certainly have not claimed that these pro drafts are in final form or whatever, that uh, yeah. there is work that needs to be done on these drafts uh, uh, in terms of uh, editorial and completeness and things like that. Uh, it's, it's not editorial. We well, change no, from I, I, open flow to new protocol, then I can show you how this protocol is even worse than what open flow was. So, and I was also going to say that there, well, I there, mean, this, are, this, there are three implementations. This but. is not related to the discussion that we, we have from the point of view of, there are actually carriers that want to have a solution now, okay, on the fixed network. The requirements coming, we, we looked into that. Requirements for, for fixed network, for control plane, user plane separation are much different than the requirements coming from the fixed mobile convergence network. So to be very different, and I, 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 I can tell you now the, uh, the conclusion of the of the study will be that it will not be possible to have the same solution. Okay, um, but okay, this is something that is not yet uh, uh, say uh, worked out. What I want to say here is the timeline. Suppose that we like to to have a common solution because that that will be maybe you know something that even in the for the fixed network will have to use uh, a very complex uh, co complex protocol. Um, suppose that that will be the case. When the solution will be ready, I mean, according to the GPP, uh, say, uh, uh, timeline, uh, it will be after release 17 or after release 17, it will be after 2021. Uh, carriers that want to have a solution now, I mean, now or next year, it will not be possible to use that uh, solution anymore. So they have to wait uh, a very long time until the GPP comes up with the solution that will be, say, a common solution for everything. So my comment is we are, you know, putting this whole umbrella, calling it fixed mobile convergence. What we presented here is a multi-access BNG. You remove fixed mobile convergence, that's just a terminology, and you have different interpretations of that. Today we see customers deploying BNG with fixed access or fixed wireless access. When you look at convergence as a whole, that is also integrating broadband with a 5G core, which is slightly different. So I would say that what is presented here, it only works for Ethernet access on a BNG. It is not addressing the multi-access part of a BNG, leaving even convergence aside, because convergence can mean different things so, to different people. So I'm cutting off the line here, so the three people can can still talk. Um, okay. Uh, so so yeah, keep keep your comments, uh, you know, under a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ning Zhong Huawei again. Uh, I think. Uh, a, Donna, can you back to your slides of the liaison? The first, li first liaison. 
Uh, yeah, I do believe this liaison is still valid because if we go to the second liaison, it's not a replacement of this first liaison. I think the first is encourage ITF to do the work, and the second is just give more information about, okay, we are doing the FMC stuff. I think that currently, uh, I, I see that this clear requirement and also operator and the vendor show the interest and have also the implementation on the market, so people need that. Okay, this one perspective. We are not, you, you know, if we send the liaison, I'm okay, but not send the liaison to say, okay, we are trying to, you know, have some unified protocol and give us that. We can send the liaison back to I, BBF to clarify, okay, this one, first one is still valid, so people can do that work. And I think that we are not against the scenario of, of FMC. It's a kind of new work. We can do that, you know, collaborate with uh, everyone. I think here we are, but for, we need to clarify wh what is the short term target. What so is so we're, we're at the end of the session. So yeah, I, yeah, I shut the line my, off. So, so go ahead and, uh, good point. Thanks. Hi, uh, Dave Allen Erickson, also the wireless wireline director at Broadband Forum. Um, a bit of context as to the complication that we're discussing was that one of the requirements for FMC that was brought forward by the, the 10 or so carriers that requested it was they wanted support for existing RGs, which meant that what we were going to end up with was a platform that integrated into the 5G core, but also would terminate the existing suite of access protocols, such as IPOE and PPPOE. Hence the concern that I raised uh, in Montreal, which is we really have an opportunity to jerk the industry around here by having many protocols that essentially support the same user-facing functionality. Uh, and this was part of the motivation for the second liaison that came out, was we have this issue and we really want to get our heads around making sure we're actually asking the right things of the industry. You know, we are, and I, I just don't know of any other way to phrase that in terms of trying to, you know, at least provide some clarity as to why there is this, how, how this situation has emerged. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Wolfgang Beck, Deutsche Telekom. I just wanted to second the notion that fixed mobile conversion is not as straightforward as many people like to believe because there's a whole class of products that simply aren't there in the mobile world, like business access. Okay, thanks. So um, we're closing out the session here. Uh, we, we'd, we'd cut off the mics. So no, the session's over, sorry. Uh, but we'll see you on Thursday. If you haven't signed the blue sheets, uh, please sign them. So, so far, no, no, so the conclusion is both group, as much as we would like to see convergence, there is no convergence yet. BBF is yet to come as advisory, so we see space for both groups to continue with work. Meanwhile, absolutely, and we are going to work on liaison towards BBF. So hopefully there's more clarity by you know, next ATF. And by the way, they call us slow and... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.